So what does criminology, law, or white collar crime have to do with any of this? And if white collar crime was involved, why haven't there been any major prosecutions resulting from the current crisis? These are all, as far as I know, legitimate questions. Uh, and so this is what I'm going to try to answer today. I'm going to try to answer those questions and have some time for discussion. Um, the impetus to this talk comes from a paper I'm working on, actually finishing another draft of this. Um, and it, it, it works off of a, paper, a very famous paper that was written by uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, that some of you may remember as, as senator from New York, a uh, very famous sociologist who taught at Harvard before he entered the U.S. Senate, one of those rare academics who was, you know, working both sides. And he wrote this piece called Defining Deviancy Down. And I guess without going into all this detail in the paper, the easiest way to describe it would be to show you the next slide, because what he was talking about was that we essentially tolerate a lot of crime in society. We, we still, even though crime is quote unquote down, the United States is still one of the most crime-ridden places of any, uh, we of any Western developed nation on the face of the earth. And he was having this conversation with a judge in New York, and the judge is quoted saying, the slaughter of innocence remains on abated subway riders, bodega owners, cab drivers, babies, and laundromats, and cash machines, on elevators and hallways. The victims and these crime sites were being treated with a quote unquote near narcoleptic state that could diminish the human condition to the level of combat infantrymen who, in protracted campaigns, can eat their battlefield rations seated on the bodies of the fallen, friend and foe alike. In other words, we become so numb to this over time that we just simply live with it. We live with, it, with, with many people, obviously, Moynihan and his judge felt were absurd levels of deviance and crime. And so, and this comes from an idea, uh, and this is what Moynihan is critiquing, comes from an idea from a very famous French sociologist, many consider to be the father of American sociology, Emile Durkheim, who saw crime as a normal part of healthy society. Because crime isn't so bad, we always have to have some level of deviance in crime in society. There are no societies anywhere, small groups, whatever, that do not have some level of deviance. And so Moynihan argued that this failed to attend properly to the fact that crime can occur at different rates. But how much is, when, when does that normal level of crime and deviance become bad? This was the question that Durkheim never answered. So when does the normal, quote unquote, become abnormal and unacceptable? And this is what pushed uh, Moynihan to write his piece regarding finding the agency down. So I've taken that and talked about this notion of not only do we trivialize common crime and deviance, we tend to trivialize white collar crime. We live with absurd amounts of it. We don't discover most of it. It costs much more, much more. Every expert that, that studies this will tell you it costs many, many times more than the quote unquote common crime problem. Uh, and we're still so far away from even dealing with it. And that, that's what, what this talk is going to get to. And so what are the reasons for this? Why do we trivialize white collar crime? Why don't people see it as important? Well, a few reasons. It's rarely dramatic. It doesn't usually make the headline news. It's not some kind of you know, a very gory crime. There's no blood spattered walls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's diffuse victimization. That means many of the worst white collar crimes don't affect individuals so much as the one or two people. They affect everyone. The savings and loan crisis is an example. Only cost U.S. citizens, taxpayers, uh, $160 million. Only. Well, you spread that out, and it works out to a lot of money per person that was lost in that debacle. That's that's what we're talking about, diffuse victimization. They didn't pick your pocket. They did. They did it collectively. So it's diffuse victimization affecting large numbers of people directly. Um, they're also seen sometimes as paper crimes. My color crimes are paper crimes in, in that they really don't hurt anyone. It's just, it's finance, it's paper. Well, when we talk about medical fraud, for example, we're also talking about uh, lost funds for medical care, which does hurt people. Uh, and unnecessary surgeries and other types of tests, which uh, are not necessary, which are also, uh, you can see, as physically harmful to people. So they're not just paper crimes, but again, most many people say it's just paper crime, it's economic. Uh, many of them never come before a court, so we don't even get to realize that it's white collar crimes, even though they, they take place. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a few moments. Um, the requisite element of intent is elusive. This is probably the understatement of the year for most 
serious white collar crime, uh, especially those occurring within corporate uh, settings, where you have armies of lawyers, layers of bureaucracy, uh, numbers of individuals working in the same areas. So it's very difficult for any prosecutorial team to find uh, intent. Now, if you notice some of the cases, some of the most notorious cases that come out, uh, intent is established quickly, easily, and if there's a smoking gun someplace. And sometimes it's just serendipitous. It's lucky that it was there. If those things weren't seen, the case probably never would have been prosecuted, but then settled. So, for example, the recent uh, Goldman, since we were talking about Goldman Sachs, uh, the recent Goldman Sachs case, uh, which I was testifying about, uh, involved a hedge fund manager who was actually picking <laughs> the securities to go into these packages that Goldman was still selling to other people. This person was selecting the securities to go into them. They didn't tell the buyers that this was happening. This, so Goldman is selling this, making commissions on these, on these uh, uh, transactions. Um, and the same person who was selecting these securities to go into these packages was betting against the investment. And th it was insane. And Goldman's rationale was, we, we just do God's work. You know, we just, we just we make markets. You know, well, I guess they're doing God's work if God wants to blow up people or something. And it, it didn't make any sense to me. But there was a lawyer who had this really great observation about that at the, at the hearing. He said, um, that's like you or I going in to buy a car and not being told by the salesperson that if we buy that car, there's a third party that's going to take a life insurance policy out of us. <laughs> and I thought about that for a second. That's really good. This guy went to Harvard. He's brilliant. He's a brilliant idea. And I said, wait a minute, but he didn't get the whole thing. And really, the correct analogy would be um, that you go to buy a car, you're not being told that there's a third party taking a life insurance policy out of you, and that that third party also selected all of the safety equipment in the car. <laughs> anyway, they paid, a, they paid a $500 million fine to get out of that. And you know, the government would have had to spend who knows how much money to try to prosecute that. But they paid a half a billion dollars. And to them, it's pocket change. It's like you or I paying a 20 or 50 or 100 dollar parking so, so why? You know, they... So another reason that we trivialize white power crime is the captains of industry. And we really see them as criminals. This has been you know, something that we, we couldn't, we had not gotten our arms around for a long time. Probably some change in the last 20 years. But you know, the pillars of the community, the captains of industry, people who do such great things for the economy, et cetera, et cetera, how can they possibly end up doing something bad? Uh, that's another reason why we tend to trivialize. Another reason is that organizations, this comes from some socio legal literature on organizations as both weapons and shields. Organizations, just like just like a robber can use a gun or a knife, people can use organizations as weapons. And we don't tend to think of that really until well, probably the savings and loan crisis was the first time we ever saw that happening, where people were literally driving their own institutions to ruin because they were profiting from it. Usually it's the other way around. You usually try to get a lot of money and then pay yourself, but they were literally uh, destroying financially insured institutions and looting them. That's, and we've seen that in the corporate skills, we're seeing it today. So the organization is what weapon shield is another reason. System capacity issues. Um, our capacity to deal with white collar crime, given the, the strength, the, the, the enormity of the financial system, the economic system in the United States, is, is very, very low. Uh, we, we don't have a very strong enforcement system. We don't have, a, you know, with all the talk about, oh, we're over-regulated, there's so much regulation. You really, if you look at the numbers, it's pretty pitifully small. And I've looked at the numbers in Japan, which is half the, about the half the size, it was at the time I looked, about half the size of the US economy. Their enforcement apparatus, measured by their version of the SEC, was about one thirteenth the size of the United States. So you can imagine how much white collar crime they're finding in Japan. Not very much. So what is white collar crime? Just to give you a brief introduction, Edwin Sutherland, one of the fathers of American criminology, taught at Indiana University uh, mid-century, uh, mid-20th century, defined it as white collar crimes as an illegal act committed by a person of respectability and high social status in the course of his occupation. That was defining the term, and it's very loose, doesn't really talk about corporate acts, it talks about individual ones. Um, Sutherland is not really uh, concerned very much with providing a, a, a 
very precise definition, but that's basically what people see it as, something around that, and we we'll talk about that more if you like. Um, but it contains an element that might reasonably be labeled as quote-unquote propaganda, and that is uh, it focuses on the wrongdoing by those in prestige positions. And a lot of people have taken uh, uh, white collar crime with a grain of salt because of that, and say, well, this is just attacking the rich, or it's attacking powerful individuals. That really wasn't Sutherland's point. Uh, he was trying to do something larger with criminological theory, saying, I have a theory that explains all crime, including this type. And that was what he was concerned about. He wasn't concerned about just attacking people who were in powerful positions. Uh, and to bring this to, up to date, there was a recent piece written by two pretty well-known scholars uh, in criminology, Neil Shover and Francis Cullen, um, where they talk about this populist versus patrician perspective on white collar crime. So if you want to just divide people into two camps, uh, the researchers, that is, in terms of how they see white collar crime, you have one camp that takes a very legalistic and narrow view of what white collar crime is, and that that's a patrician view. And it minim minimizes the impact of white collar crime because it only considers adjudicated acts, legally adjudicated acts, criminal convictions, as the basis for understanding white collar crime, versus what they call a populist view, which is broad. It looks at that, but it also says that there are many cases that are settled that if the prosecutors had the resources or wanted to go after them, or it was politically uh, sound to go after them, um, they, could, they could have made those cases. So in other words, uh, not everything has to be adjudicated legally. But this, this debate's been going on 50, 60 years. And of course, the more conservative economics folks or business folks would say, well, it's not like up, I'm not going to do anything. And the sociologists and anthropologists and other social scientists would say, well, look at all these settlements that are quote unquote civil fraud. And you need to tell us that there's absolutely no intent, there would be no intent of that at all. So this is really the, the debate that goes on today. So let's talk about the global crisis. Is this more trivialization? Well, here's some, some numbers for you. Um, the actual extent of law breaking remains to be seen. I just read in the Wall Street Journal last week that uh, the uh, FDIC, when the SEC, I think it was the FDIC, now starting to take on uh, uh, cases in over 300 failed banks. Is just starting to do this? In the SNL crisis, they were all over this. They had task forces, and the SNL crisis was about 1 30th the size of what we're experiencing in this meltdown. There's been a 36% staff reduction since 2001 in FBI agents dealing with white collar crime. This has now been boosted up in the last year or so through new legislation. Obama administration, but it's, it's way too late at this point. These people are gone, the evidence is gone, they should have been subpoenaing emails immediately doing all this, getting the regulators involved, a few that were actually regulated um, in this debate, but never did anything. Uh, the number of criminal cases brought by the FBI has, has dropped by slightly more than one quarter during the same period. So the number of white collar criminal cases has dropped, and again, 2001, the, the uh, year of 9-11, uh, of that explains it. They shifted all of these FBI agents away from healthcare fraud, white collar crime, um, and put them on terrorism, and never replaced the people doing the white collar cases. This is what happened during uh, the Bush administration. So fall off rate in white collar crime prosecutions at one point, I think it was about a year ago when I measured this, had reached a 50% level. The prosecutions dropped to uh, so again, going back to my earlier point, does this mean there's no white collar crime? It just means that there's no one prosecuting white collar crime. One of the folks I like to read, because I, I don't like to read economics, I'm not an economist, and uh, one of the people I like to read is Paul Kirkman, who writes a lot in the New York Times, Princeton economist, private Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he wrote a great piece a couple of years ago, if you can find it on the, on the net, I highly recommend it. It's called, How Do Economists Get It So Wrong? You know, the post-mortem. You know, what, why didn't any of these people see this? They were very brilliant people. How could they say now, oh, we, how could you expect us to know? You, know? you can't be dumb and smart. You can't really be that stupid and that quiet at the same time. Well, he says this. He said, they turned a blind eye to the limitations of human rationality that often leads to bubbles and busts, to the problems of institutions that run amok to imperfections of markets, especially financial markets. 
that can cause the economy's operating system to undergo sudden, unpredictable crashes and to the dangers created when regulators don't believe in regulation. I think this kind of says it in a nutshell, but I'm just a novice in technology. Um, as critical as this is, and, and I respond to this in, 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 a, in a larger paper, it still trivializes the element of criminality. You notice he's not talking about criminality at all. He's talking about institutions that run amok. Uh, would that somehow imply any criminality? Or would they just like to run amok? You know, so you use the euphemism. So what, what does Obama like to say? Rip-offs. Talks about the rip-offs. So, well, are you talking about crime or what is a rip-off? Um, so I'm asking this question. We have collective amnesia, fear of the F word, or both. And the F word here, by the way, is fraud. That's the F word I use. It's fraud. So do we have collective amnesia? Do we just afraid to say the word, or is it both? Uh, so we look at the 1980s savings and loan crisis. $160 billion cost of taxpayers, as I mentioned, the largest set of white collar crimes in history, which is still under some debate, but at least even the conservative side says there was uh, some white collar crime, which is not so much. The 2002 corporate uh, meltdowns, Enron, WorldCom, and Delphi, Arthur Anderson, and others, trillions of dollars of market losses due to this phony accounting that was going on in these companies, criminal convictions of corporate insiders. This is crime. These people were convicted. They are serving prison sentences right now. So are we denying that there was crime involved in that? And the 1994 Orange County bankruptcy, one of my favorites, because it happened right here, right? One of the richest counties in the country. Um, the largest municipal failure in U.S. history. Criminal convictions of the treasurer and the assistant treasurer, because it was fraud. They got convicted. They didn't steal the money for themselves. Uh, but they were uh, playing, again, accounting schemes and covering up the losses, which is fraud. The Board of Supervisors was charged with, with official misconduct, the highest civil sanction short of being indicted for a crime. This is the entire Board of Supervisors. And what we saw, what we thought was fiscal conservatism, which is what Orange County is famous for, turned out to be wild gambling of public funds that was enabled by fraud. So what we thought was a very conservative, staid uh, uh, way of investing that was somehow producing these great returns turned out to be fraud. But we, the, 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 those, those profits did not really exist. So what is this control for? This is the, this is the one concept that I want to, that, that I harp on a lot in my own research because I think it has to do with all of these debacles and, and puts them in, in a conceptual framework that makes sense. Um, what is control for it? Well, in criminology, generally, and I won't get into all the specifics, but it's the person's controlling a seemingly legitimate entity that uses it as a weapon to defraud. So all of these insiders, all of the cases I was just citing, involve this. Someone on the inside found out a way to suborn all the controls, internal and external, to bribe the auditors, to pay large amounts of consulting fees to accounting firms, uh, to uh, arrange these things and then audit them. Um, and one of the books that was written uh, by one of our students here, Bill Black, the best way to rob a bank is to own one. That's a great line. Um, <laughs> he stole it from Henry Gonzalez, who, uh, who mentioned it in Congress uh, at a hearing. Uh, Bill Black was, by the way, the guy who we met in our savings and loan research. He was a San Francisco regulator at the time of the Office of Thrift Supervision. He was the guy responsible for nailing Charles Keating. Wow. He gave up his life as you know, any political future because he did the right thing. He nailed Charles Keating. This was against you know, the Bush administration was trying to save him. They, they, they got the regulators off of him. It didn't matter. He stayed on that, testified about a dozen times in front of Congress. He and Ed Gray, and this is a great story, Ed Gray was a uh, former speechwriter for Governor Reagan. Reagan was governor of California, good buddy of Reagan. Reagan brings him to Washington in the 19, to become uh, chief of staff at the White House. He doesn't like it. Comes, Ed Reagan comes back to California. Ed Reagan calls him again a couple years later and says, I need you to be the head of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, which at that time was the OTS, before the OTS. So he takes the regulatory job. He, within a year, he sees that all the deregulatory policies and everything else that his good friend was pushing and they were doing 
Washington were not working, that there were these hoods, these thieves in the savings and loan industry, and he started to blow the whistle. Uh, that cost him his political career as well. He served out his term. They tried to get him to resign. Charles Keating actually tried to buy him out of his job because he was standing in the way of Charles Keating's continual uh, looting of Lincoln Savings Alone, which again was right here in Irvine, California. Right? And he was looting it to support his own real estate company, American Continental Corporation. Just an amazing history. Anyway, so Bill Black uh, did that. He also, if you've seen the movie uh, Capitalism, A Love Story, any Michael Moore fans out there? Yeah, he's the guy in the middle of the movie who gives Michael Moore the entire storyline to the movie. He's the professor from, now he's a professor at the University of Missouri. Uh, and we're writing, we're writing a book, actually, we're book, book is what we're, we're communicating right now, and we're writing a book on the, on the current scandal using this notion of control for us. So in any case, you see what I PhD. So I call him the most dangerous man in America. Right? Economist, lawyer, former regulator, and criminologist. I know this is. They have a wanted poster for him up in Goldman Sachs office or someplace. Um, and in the book I did with Kitty and, and Bob that I showed you earlier, Good Money Crime, we also did a report to the National Institute of Justice, giving them all the data, the statistics, the processing, the crimes, how they occurred, everything. Um, and then, so the criminology, that's what control for, that's where it's born from, essentially. And in economics, they simply refer to, as far as I know, I'm not an economist, so I'm simplifying. They refer to it as looting, and one of the most famous articles written about that was uh, by uh, George Akerlof and uh, his colleague Romer. Akerlof's a, a UC Berkeley economist, the Nobel Prize winner as well, um, who kind of agrees with our perspective, so he's kind of crazy like we are. Um, and also the National Commission uh, that looked at the uh, aftermath of the savings and loan crisis also noted the significance of control fraud. So there's some evidence for this. So what are the things that, that, that really brought us to where we are, given that, given that background? Well, the first has to do with executive compensation policies um, that turn private market discipline into perverse incentives, encouraging massive control fraud, even at the most elite firms. This is our belief, and we have no proof. We can't say, oh, yeah, see all these convicts and see all the perp walks. No, but this is what we think happened. So despite accurate warnings since September 2004 that mortgage fraud was becoming an epidemic, that was the word that was used in 2004, that mortgage fraud was becoming an epidemic in the United States, the FBI reacted, and that was an FBI statement by the way, they reacted to its severe system capacity problems in a manner that failed to challenge Bush administration policies and it virtually guaranteed that the FBI would fail to stem the tide of fraud. Well, why? Well, essentially what they did was they entered into a major alliance with the NBA, the Mortgage Bankers Association. It turns out that most of the biggest, the, the biggest fraud, the, the loan origination frauds and other frauds uh, that were committed were committed by members of this organization. So they actually got into an alliance with who we feel were the real crooks, and they were actually looking at people who were trying to defraud the banks, the borrowers. Which, you know, if you look at all the data that exists right now, the borrowers had very little to do with this. Yeah, there were some borrowers out there who were, who were, who were getting long, quote unquote, liars' loans, who knew what they were doing. But a lot of times borrowers didn't. I'll give you one example. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was invited to give a talk to the um, Orange County Prosecutor's Office. And after the talk, there were a bunch of investigators, and we had a nice talk chat, I did some slideshows. And, and we went upstairs and said, Professor Pontel, we want to take you upstairs and show you some of this, right? They take me up to a room. They had an evidence room, uh, wooden bookshelves all around, boxes on these bookshelves. And, and one of the supervisors said, just, just pull, pull one of the boxes. And it's the whole room full of these. Pulls a box, and pulls out a piece of paper and shows me a loan document. And the loan document clearly was fraudulent. It had cut and pasted numbers in the little boxes where the borrower had filled out their correct numbers. The loan originator said, well, this is never going to get the loan. We've got to fix this. And they cut and pasted the numbers without the borrower's knowledge and then sent the fax it over to the underwriter and said, this looks great. We've got to get the loan. And so they come back to the borrower and say, hey, guess what? We got you qualified. The borrower goes, yay, yippee, you're wonderful. It was all fraud. And they didn't tell me which, where, which loan originator it was, but we know this is one of the ground zeros for loan origination and fraud in the United States. 
States cost Florida, the other one. Um, so just another example of trivialization here. Former U.S. Attorney General um, Mukasey was quoted when, when they brought when the FBI brought this to his attention back in, in, in uh, 2004, right around that time. And they said, you know, we need direct action by the Department of Justice on this. And Casey goes, oh, that's white collar street crime. That's just some loan originators, you know, whatever. It's none of the banks or anyone above them. No, no Wall Street involvement. So you don't need to have a uh, federal task force. We don't need to have task forces around the country. This is exactly what they did in the savings and loan scandal, which was so important for bringing anyone to justice. They brought over a thousand executives uh, into court, convicted them, and put them in prison during that time. How many have we gotten today? I'll tell you, it's the loose end. Zero. Zero. And this is 30 times bigger, but it involved no fraud. As I say, sarcastically, discussed. Um, Neoclassical economists are blinded by an ideology. And again, it's the neoclassical economists who have who've basically driven policy for the last 20, 25 years. Uh, even with Obama's economic team, there wasn't very much change between the two administrations. You had the same people with the same failed ideas that were involved in both administrations. And some of these failed ideas have to do with these notions. They proclaim free markets as the panacea to everything. Free markets solve everything. Right? Uh, they see regulation as the boogeyman. It's like, that can never be good. They dichotomize. It's regulation versus no regulation. Right? You do regulate or you don't regulate, which is also a false dichotomy. And of course, this trivializes the role of fraud. I gave a talk in Texas last year, and it was kind of a hard sell. It's a very conservative area like, like Orange County. And, uh, and, I, and I didn't know how to explain this any better, but I just said, you know, and football is very good in Texas. If you've never been to Texas, they love football. Football, they, it's religion, right? And so I said, just think of a football game. Right? You're all into football, you can get this. Think of a football game, uh, Super Bowl, the championship, whatever it is. Uh, and the referees were only on the field, and no one was enforcing the rules. And it was a huge prize at the end, they were going to get a zillion dollars or something like that. What would it devolve into very quickly? Are there the human body parts flying around? It would be very much fun to watch. It would, it would be a gory sight. Would anyone just be honoring the rules? I don't think so. So the, the bottom line is that every game has rules. Every economy, every system has some boundaries. It has rules. And it's just, you know, the real question is, well, how much do you enforce and how many rules do you need? So it's not like we don't need rules versus we need rules. It's how do we do it properly, efficiently, and make it work and stop the fraud. So business context leading to the latest crisis constituted with criminologists have for some time noted as crime facilitated environments. We created a perverse environment through just really horrible government policy that did not recognize any potential for fraud whatsoever, we created a crime for so bad environment. And that's the environment in which all these frauds took place. The loan origination fraud, the securitization frauds, the disclosure frauds, you name it, all up and down the line. Epidemics of fraud echoing off one another with incentives from one part pushing the other part of our financial system. So crime facilitated environments are places where white collar crimes, in this case, can flourish, and they do. So trivializing the lunatic white collar crime rate entails incredibly high social costs. The scale of the current financial crisis is simply a case in point. I'm going to end in a couple of seconds here because I want some time for, for you to talk. Um, and again, you can relate this, these ideas not just to the current crisis, but why we've had these recurrent, intensifying crises over the last 25 years. They're of slightly different form, but we end up in the same place. We end up in the same place. So to prevent future ones, we must find the real causes and why we failed to learn from prior crises. And part of that has to do with the cause, the perverse or primitogenic incentives that we create and don't recognize. We just refuse to recognize them. Our economists refuse to recognize them. Or well, the economists that are advising policy refuse to recognize them. We also have a failure to learn, and this is related to, again to these, what I call the theoclassical ideology, it's almost like a religion, uh, about the four developments. Private market discipline, which solves everything. <laughs> executive compensation, which the more we give executives, the better, uh, even if it's not related to performance, which drives companies into bankruptcy. Um, 
Reputational cost. This is also interesting. This comes out of the law and economics literature, the Bible, so to speak, of the law and economics literature. It talks about reputational cost. And so we don't need to regulate because there's reputational costs involved in here. No good accounting firm would ever risk their reputation to help with control fraud. Uh -huh. Well, tell that to Arthur Anderson. Yeah. You know. Um, <laughs> regulation, again, the boogeyman. So these are the dogmas that we, we, we typically live by that, that create these problems. And also are our leading export. Other countries want to have great economies too. So when Japan does the same thing that we do, and say, oh yeah, that's a great corporate governance idea, let's do that. And so they start to have the same window, what they call window dressing scandals in Japan. In fact, right after our 2002 corporate and accounting meltdown, Japan had a huge similar meltdown on their stock market. The same kinds of frauds. So we export this to other countries. Very, very good. Last, last note from Krugman. Um, and this relates to what Greenspan uh, was saying um, and his assurances before the, the crisis. He says, what's striking when you read Greenspan's assurances, that everything's fine, you know, there's no bubble, you know, these escalating home prices, this is normal, this is good, is that they weren't based on evidence. They were based on the a priori assumption that there simply cannot be a bubble in housing, because that was the finance theory that Greenspan believed in. And the finance theorists were even more adamant on this point. In a 2007 interview, Eugene Fama, the father of the efficient market hypothesis, declared that, quote, the word bubble drives me nuts. And went on to explain why we can trust the housing market. He says, quote, housing markets are less liquid, but people are very careful when they buy houses. It's typically the biggest investment they're going to make. So they look around very carefully and they compare prices. The bidding process is very detailed. Well, of course, all that may be true, except it says nothing about whether the overall price of the house is justified. That part is left out of the analysis. And that's where the fraud comes in. So, so these theorists and others, a lunatic rate of white collar and corporate offending was not a central aspect of the current global meltdown. And I think it's time for academics, practitioners, and policymakers to seriously challenge this fundamentally flawed yet highly influential. But if you want to want to question it, the, the, the real problem or, or is, is our democratic system, <laughs> if you will. The way that Washington operates and the way that it operates through lobbying. And what I was told on numerous trips to Washington before the new financial uh, legislation was enacted, which is a good thing, um, was that it entailed the biggest lobbying effort in American history on the part of the Wall Street firms to deny that legislation. There was so much pressure. It wasn't like you were getting two or three visits a day. There were armies of lobbyists being paid by Wall Street firms in trying to influence and shut that down as quickly as possible. They failed because that's how serious problems. But the rebound is that now, what I've been told, is that there's still an incredible lobbying attempt going on to try to um, take the teeth out of that legislation, to try to get enforcement so bland that you know, you'll have the law and then no one will be enforcing it, and then we can go back and blame regulation again. And then go back to a free market model, which will just give us more craziness. So what we're seeing now, uh, the reports now, is just that the, the lobbying is just intensified to try to make sure that, you know, that, that legislation just is not carried forward. You know, that it's, it, it's an active but not enforced. What would you assess Obama's biggest mistake was it? Pointing Summers and Geithner, or was it something else? Well, one of, one of the things that uh, Bill Black, who was much more familiar with, with this than I, because he was a regulator and actually did this when he was a regulator, uh, one of the things he says that I, that I agree with is that uh, what Obama should have done uh, was not to bail out these institutions, but when these institutions, and there's a law, there's actually a law that uh, we'll be looking at much more, but there's a law that was created during the savings and loan crisis, which said that the government had to close any financial institution that declared insolvency. So when you had these huge, you know, then you get into the too big to fail issue. So when Citibank and these others are saying, hey, we're insolvent, well, guess what? what? What's supposed to happen is that the government says, good, you're insolvent, all the management is gone, the institution is taken over, it's closed over the weekend. It's reopened the next week with new management who've been sitting by the sidelines who did not engage in any of the shenanigans that those folks were engaging in. In other words, there have been a lot of great people sitting on the sidelines for the last 10 years. 
These are regulated, basically regulators who believed in regulation. They, they're totally employable, but they weren't employable under the, uh, under the last 12 years. I don't think Obama's straightened that out. As a side note to that, IndyMac, some of you probably had investments, I know one person had an investment in the uh, CD, which was safe. Uh, when IndyMac went under, it created a big, you know, that was the first big shot here on the West Coast. So you know, the person who was in charge, and I can't, I'm trying to bring up his name, but I can't bring up, the person who was in charge of the Western region of the OTS, that was supposed to be regulating the OTS, this person was the biggest failed regulator for the savings of long crisis. <laughs> this is the person who we had in charge of one of the biggest set of financial institutions in the country. So is it any, is it any surprise that did Obama straighten all that? No. Neither administration has straightened that out. There's still plenty of really great, and so what I'm saying is they should have closed the banks and not bailed them out. Um, they should have said, oh, you're insolvent, you're out. And, there, and, and the argument at the time was, oh, you can't do that because that would create so much fuss, blah, blah, blah. No, it doesn't. Everyone's accounts are the same. Everyone's accounts are insured. You get new management in, and it opens the next day. Well, they did it across the street with Washington Mutual. And it just opened up, and a few days later, it was chased. Yeah. All your accounts are the same. You just change, get the new stuff. And it's, that's what the government's supposed to do. That's what they should have done. A question about two personalities, one, Elliot Spitzer, and two, uh, uh, Simon Johnson at MIT. I don't know Simon Johnson. He wrote a book of 13 bankers. He believes that the top 13 should be broken up, and his storyline is very similar to yours. Oh, he, he uses a euphemism entitled uh, regulation capture, where just like with Andrew Jackson and the Bank of the United States, these guys own Congress, the top 13 banks. Yeah. Well, own Congress or lo just, as I said, have an army of lobbyists, can afford an army of lobbyists to, to make sure that they get their will most of the time. Chris Dunn yeah, was a case in point where yeah. he, it was shown that he got a sweetheart loan from uh, Countrywide. Country right. One of Angelo's friends, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. Why are we all Angelo's friends? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I can't speak to Johnson, but I'll give me the site, because I'll, I'll, especially someone who agrees with me, I'll definitely read that. <laughs> Baseline scenario.com. Right, okay. Uh, but it's, in terms of Spitzer, um, actually Spitzer and Bill Black have written uh, some, um, uh, some editorials about this, and, and Spitzer being the, the, you know, the corporate fighter, so to speak, the, the new, uh, I guess, I don't want to equate it with Ralph Nader, but similar in terms of spirit, in terms of you know, fighting fraud, etc. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think he's very far from this argument at all, so essentially uh, he's good colleagues with Bill Black. Uh, I've written to him a couple of times and uh, kind of all on the same page. And I'm sure it's similar to Simon, Simon Johnson. Yes. I will definitely check him out. Thank you. Yes. If Last Eagle had still been in effect, would we have had the situation? Probably not. But a lot of things would affect. And again, I think the laws, you know, in terms of my, my, my own affiliation, I'm not in a law school. I'm in a, in a group that we call ourselves law and society. If you're in a law school, you're concerned with the laws, written laws. If you're in a group uh, that's called law and society, you're interested in the laws in action. And so, regardless, I think it certainly would have helped to have less people, which would you know, not would create a more regulatory structure. But um, it's really whether the laws are enforced. And so again, if you have regulators who do not believe in regulation being the heads of these agencies, it's going to be a disaster. Jack Peltzer, I remember a long time ago, I had a, a, a 
discussion Jack about this little famous political scientist up on the chancellor here. And he, and he said to me, so you know what we should do? He said, when we convict these folks, he said, we should make sure that all of their assets are gone. Because, you know, you can look at the cases of Martha Stewart. Some people say, well, she got a slap in the hand. Other people said, no, they prosecuted her because she's a woman. They didn't do the inside. That's a whole different thing. But you, know, you can look at Martha Stewart, pay a big fine, but she still has hundreds of millions and millions of dollars. Michael Milken, right? Paid a $600 million fine. His last year of earnings was a billion and a half dollars. So what is that? You know, so and, and, it's, and how did they have to get Michael Milton? Did they get him for doing all the shenanigans in the junk bond market? No. They had to wire Ivan Boski and then get Milton on a ticky tack crime of uh, illegal uh, stock parking with, with Boski, which wasn't essential to anything that he did that nearly destroyed the entire US economy. But again, I speak from one side. There were business people on the other side that say, oh Michael Milton was a genius, and he did this and that. 